fine. So, this is a good estimator. Given data, it gives me good estimators. Uh, is there something else that might be typically available in practice? And if so, um, is the maximum likelihood estimator still the best thing to do or is there something else that one can do? Of course, I am being vague here. So, let me make that a little bit more precise um, and then and then we will try to see how you can potentially come up with different estimators which might be in some cases better than the maximum likelihood estimators. Um, and to, to do this, uh, let us again go back and revisit our simple uh, example of coin toss. So, our model is still the coin toss model. Uh, you, you observe data which is 0 and 1 um, and you are going to make an assumption that it comes from box with a coin with some unknown bias p of generating heads um, and, and you press it n times you get the coin, you get uh, n data points, n observations, all that is the same. But now, the extra thing, uh, piece of information that you have is that um, somebody comes and says, uh, so let us let us let me put this down, consider the coin example, coin example. By the way, the coin uh, tosses are called as Bernoulli trials, right. So, like how the Gaussian, so the corresponding random variable in the coin are called as Bernoulli uh, trials, okay. So, so you have the coins x1 to xn. Uh, so, this is uh, basically uh, all uh, all my xis are Bernoulli, that is what it means with some parameter p. This is the probability of xi equals 1 for all i. It is the same setup. Um, we have this in addition, <coughs> let us say somebody came and told you the following statement. I believe the bias p is somewhere is, is, is close to 1. let us say someone said this. Now, imagine a situation where you have this box and the box has a coin inside about which at this point you do not know anything. Let us say you have not even seen the data, but then somebody you know walks in and says, hey, I believe that you know the bias p um, is somewhere close to 1. Now, you have this extra piece of information uh, which is an English sentence, right. So, somebody says that they believe that p is close to 1, that is an English sentence. Uh, nevertheless, it is a statement that gives you some information about the coin inside the box. And this is what we will call as, you know, in general domain knowledge, let us say, right. So, uh, it, the statement could be anything, um, it could be closer to 1 or maybe they are saying something like, I know it is uh, it's small the p is either small or either too high, but then I am sure that it is not close to 0.5. That is also a statement somebody could make, right. So, all these are statements that people could make or you might have as an as a practitioner uh, from, you know, from your experience, uh, you might have what I am going to call as, you know, hunch uh, about data, uh, about the mod parameters, not the data, about the parameters. we may have hunch about the parameters, right. So, remember these hunches have nothing to do with the data, right. So, the data we have not even seen a single data point yet. Even before seeing the data points, um, in the previous case of maximum likelihood uh, estimators, if I did not give you data and then I asked you, well, what, what would be your guess for the underlying model that generates the data? you go blank, right. So, because there is no way you could make a guess because your method depends only on data. Only if you give, give me data, I will be able to say what might be a good guess. If there is no data, there is no other information that I have. Maximum likelihood estimator depends completely on data. But in practice, you might have something more than the data, which is the hunch that I am talking about here. Um, and now, it might be good and it will be very good if we had a principled way to incorporate our hunch into our estimation process, right. So, is there a way we can, you know, somehow codify our hunch into mathematically more precise uh, mechanisms that can be, you know, incorporated into our 
estimation procedure itself. If so, how can we do this, right? So, this is what we are going to see next um, and this will take us to uh, what is known as um, uh, a Bayesian modeling approach. Again, for people who have seen this, this might be a recap. Um, otherwise, this can be thought of as a primer in Bayesian modeling, right? So, the goal is to incorporate these hunches that we have, that we might have. Um, so, how, how, how can we do that, right? So, that is the question. Um, so, goal um, incorporate hunch uh, or belief about uh, parameters of interest into the estimation procedure. And how do we do this? Um, <clears throat> the way we are going to think of this is as follows, right? So, um, the approach that we will take to do this is as follows. Um, so, we are going to think of the parameter that we are trying to estimate. as a random variable and and I'll tell you what that means uh, intuitively but that's the that's the approach that we are going to take so basically we have this hunch right so earlier um, you know we are we were thinking of the parameter as some mu or some p right so this is what uh, we were trying to estimate um, now we are saying uh, right so we are going to we are going to not you know, in some sense, we are going to encode our hunch as a distribution over this underlying parameter, right? So, earlier, this is what our goal was to get a mu or a p. Now, we are going to say, I have some hunch, uh, which is to say that, well, if I say, for example, for the case of uh, p, let us look at the case of p, uh, I know that the value of p can take any value between 0 and 1. Now, if I somebody said that, well, I think, I believe that the value, true value of p is uh, somewhere close to 0.9 or something like that or it is close to 1, uh, I might potentially put a hunch like this, right. So, what does this tell us? This, this tells us that I believe even before seeing the data that my true value of p is most likely around 0.9 or closer to 1. Right. So, in this case, I am saying 0.9, I mean that is just an example. So, this could be 0.9. Uh, depending on our hunch, we can modify this. Right. So, this might be one, one way to encode your hunch or a statement of the form, well, I know that the p is not close to 0.5. Uh, it is either too small or too big. Right. So, maybe you want a hunch that encodes that. Um, maybe you would put a distribution like this. Right. So, this is still between 0 and 1. Uh, this is 0 0.5 and essentially you can think of it as you know putting weights on each of these values of p right so because p can take in this case any value between 0 and 1 um, you can encode these weights in terms of a distribution itself right so which means i can treat this hunch itself as a random variable as a parameter itself as a random variable which has some associated distribution with it now, what does the distribution tell me? Well, without seeing the data, it kind of tells me that um, it, it gives me what is the chance I believe before seeing the data that my true parameter falls in a particular interval. That is what these things are encoding, right? So, for p, it could be like this. For, for mu, uh, you could say that, well, I think the mean mu, um, the parameter I am trying to estimate is probably around uh, minus 12.5 right so maybe that's the that's the guess that i want to encode uh, maybe i will encode that something like this right so it's it's around 12.5 it could be other things also but then i believe it's more around 12.5 than anything else if that is what i believe then this is a this is a way i could have encoded that hunch uh, before i see the data right so now now what happens is um, so so what as what are we saying we are saying that uh, we have a hunch 
uh, which is what I'm going to call as um, codified uh, using uh, a probability distribution. over theta. Let us say theta is the parameter that I am trying to estimate. Let us not fix mu or p specific values or specific parameters, but in general it is some parameter theta, which means that there is some p of theta. What does p of theta give me? Well, it, it, if, it's, if theta is a continuous parameter uh, like your p or mu, then it means that uh, it is a, it's a continuous probability distribution uh, where the support the values that theta can take are any values that you could have potentially guessed, right? Um, for p, this this could be any value between zero and one, and the shape of this p, uh, the PDF determines, you know, what is our belief about this um, the parameter of interest even before we see the data. So the hunch that we have um, can be codified using a probability distribution over theta. Uh, which can be said as p of theta, which simply tells us that, you know, if theta is uh, takes value um, in a continuous range, for example, like the um, like the p that we were trying to estimate in, in case of Bernoulli random variables, um, then this p of theta would actually be a PDF, right? So, it tells us that what, what do we believe about this underlying p in terms of probabilities. In other words, if I did not see the data and I asked you, well, uh, what is the chance that this p uh, takes a particular value in a particular range, uh, for else it takes a value in a particular range, then you can integrate this uh, PDF and then give me the probability and so on, right. So, essentially we are treating theta as a random variable, that is what it means. Now, what do we do with this hunch? Well, of course, we see the data next. So, after this we have the data um, and once we see the data, our belief system needs to be updated, right. So, we may believe that uh, the p is around 0.9, which means that we believe that, you know, the chance of heads is much higher than the chance of tails. Uh, but then if you observe 1000 data points and it so happens that, you know, 900 of them are tails, then it is against our belief system, right. So, our belief system said that we are expecting 90 percent heads, but then we actually are seeing uh, 90 percent heads on average, but then we are actually seeing, let us say, 90 percent tails, which means that we have to update our belief system accordingly as, as how the data dictates. Also, if uh, if our data adheres to our belief system, then that strengthens our belief system, right. So, then we might still want to update our belief system where we might be more confident about our, our, our guesses and so on, right. So, in, a, in any case, we after looking at this data, we need to move from hunch to an updated hunch, right. So, this needs to happen. Uh, and how can we codify the updated hunch? Well, this can be codified using um, again a probability distribution, uh, probability distribution, but then what distribution is this? This is no longer p of theta, but then it is p of theta given data, right. So, this idea of going from what I call as, what is called as prior distribution over theta to what is called as a posterior distribution of theta, but then after observing data is what is called as the uh, Bayesian way of doing things, right. So, you have a hunch, you see data, you update your hunch, right. So, uh, this is the Bayesian modeling, but then what is so Bayesian about it, right. So, where is the, where is Bayes coming into the picture? Well, uh, that is that precisely happens to describe how you go from p of theta to p of theta given data, right. So, um, where is the base coming in? So, if you remember the base law or the base theorem, um, now we know that p of a given b is from high school, we know that this is p of b given a into p of a divided by p of b, right. So, this is our standard base rule which says that a conditioned on B, the probability of A conditioned on B um, can be gotten as uh, pro with using P of A, P of B and P of B given A, right. So, if I know these three things, I can get P of A given B. Now, how does, how does this help in our case? We are going to think of A as parameters, right. So, which is simply our theta uh, and B as our data, right. So, which is x1 to xn. So, which means simply by using base, the base law, uh, we can do the following. We can say that p of theta given 
the data x1 to xn which is our updated hunch after seeing data can be written as uh, p of b given a which is p of x1 to xn the data given the parameter into p of a which is the parameter divided by the data p of x1 to xn. This is just exactly analogous to our base law um, and, and now if you notice this it, it is it gives you an excellent way to go from your prior to your posterior and what base theorem is saying is simply the following right. So, you have some initial belief about your prior distribution. Now, to go to your posterior distribution, you have to re-weigh your prior distribution. You have to make a multiplicative update to this prior and that multiplicative update is given by this specific term, uh, which also is something that we have encountered earlier, right. So, now at least the numerator is something that should be familiar to you. Um, think about what the numerator is. The numerator is saying, well, if I give you theta, we told you what the parameter is, what is the chance that I see this data? Now, this is what we have been calling as the likelihood, right. So, this is something that we already have seen. Now, the denominator is something that is independent of theta, right. So, this does not depend on theta, depend on theta. So, it is what this is the technical term for this is called as evidence. This is the chance that you actually observe the uh, data itself, uh, but then notice that it does not depend on theta. So, which means that you can think of your posterior as proportional to your likelihood times your prior. So, you are reweighting your previous belief using the likelihood and then that will give you the posterior, right. So, that is what Bayesian, Bayesian modeling essentially is telling you, right. Um, so, for example, um, I might have a hunch like this uh, example maybe I had a hunch somebody came and told me that p that uh, I am trying to get data from is close to 0.9 then I could have you know incorporated that hunch by uh, using a pdf ok let me draw this carefully. So, pdf something like this right. So, which peaks at 0.9 let us say now I see my data and let us say my I see 10 data points um, which are many of them are 0 let us say right. So, 8 of them are 0 and 2 of them are um, ones. Uh, again all of these are representative images. So, it is not exact numbers that I am plotting, but then just to give a feel right. So, now the data is kind of the likelihood is kind of telling me suggesting me that you know the p value should actually be 2 by 10, 0 0.2 whereas my belief is saying it is 0.9. So, now so if I somehow combine these uh, what I might get is something like this right. So, I might get something like this as as the updated hunch right. So, this is my hunch um, this is my updated hunch. It, it might peak somewhere perhaps at point two seven. I do not know these are just numbers that I am making up, but uh, you get the idea right. So, you start with some distribution over your possible parameter values you see the data and then you get a new distribution which is perhaps a different distribution. Um, now, if I had a different set of data points now this is a case where the, the data does not you know um, correspond to my hunch. On the other hand if I had the flipped version of this data let us say uh, something like this where you had 9 ones and 1 0. Now, in this particular case the same hunch might translate to you know a even sharper rise at 0.9 right. So, I am believing in 0.9 even further strongly right. So, because my data also in some sense corresponds to my hunch right. So, so this is uh, this is the idea of uh, you know Bayesian modeling. Um, now, let us take one simple example uh, to talk about uh, Bayesian modeling. Uh, and then we'll move on to other types of, uh, uh, you know, example uh, setups. <coughs> so again, we'll we'll talk about um, uh, how to encode the hunch when uh, data is setup is data is Bernoulli, which is the coin toss example uh, Bernoulli of p, right? So this is the 
basically when the assumption that we are making about the data is that it is Bernoulli of p, right. So, there is a box with a coin all the things that we have discussed, right. So, the, the likelihood is Bernoulli. Um, now, what is a good prior? Which means p of theta, in this case theta is just p which means how can I encode my prior? Well, of course, here I have been drawing pictures, but then mathematically how can we encode this prior? Um, one way to encode, a good way to encode this prior is using what is called as uh, uh, the beta distribution, it is called a beta prior and we will see why this is a good way to encode prior. Uh, basically, you want some continuous distribution whose values are between 0 and 1. We cannot use a Gaussian here, right? so because Gaussian can give me any value between minus infinity and infinity, but then the parameter I am trying to estimate which is p, I know takes value between 0 and 1. So, any distribution that I use as a prior to encode my prior knowledge should be su should be supported only in 0 and 1 and a good choice is, is what is called as a beta prior. So, the so once I say a beta prior, I should put down the density of this uh, distribution, right. So, the density of the beta distribution looks like as follows. Um, the density is defined for every value of p between 0 and 1 and like the Gaussian is parameterized using the mean and the variance, the beta distribution is parameterized using two values alpha and beta which are both positive numbers um, and it is given something like this, right. So, this is uh, p to the alpha minus 1, uh, 1 minus p to the beta minus 1 for all p in 0 comma 1. Um, of course, divided by some normalizing constant z which does not depend on p uh, such that this is a pdf, it integrates to 1 and so on. That is not so important for us, the, what is more important is the functional form how it depends on p. Um, so, how, what, what can this beta prior do? Let us, let us take some examples and see uh, what kind of um, pdf this looks like, right. So, if you, if you take 0 to 1, um, which is the value of p and then if um, if if I use uh, let us say p as uh, alpha as 2 and beta as 2, I get something like this, right. So, this is my pdf when alpha is 2 and beta is 2, uh, meaning my this is essentially the function uh, p into 1 minus p divided by some normalizing constant such that the area under this curve is 1 because it has to be a probability distribution. Um, and we know p into 1 minus p looks something like this, right. So, this is the case alpha is 2 and beta is 2. Um, now, when alpha is uh, let us say 2 and beta is 5, it looks something like this. Again, these are representative images. Um, this is alpha is 2, beta is 5. It kind of says that when you have small alpha and big beta, then you are kind of believing that your true p is somewhere closer to 0 than 1. If alpha is 2 and beta is 2, then it is like I am still believing that the coin is pretty much uh, unbiased. I mean my highest value is 0 0.5, but then I am spreading out my bets, right. So, so to say. Um, now, for different choices of, uh, for a different choice, for example, if uh, alpha is 0 0.5 and beta is 0 0.5, then this picture actually looks something like this. This function looks like this. It is a very flexible distribution. Uh, now, this is a case where I can encode my belief that well my p is either small or large, uh, but it is definitely not close to 0.5, right. So, it is a biased coin, right. So, it is a skewed coin that much I know. So, now that, that can be encoded using the choices of alpha is 0.5 and beta is 0.5. Okay, so this is this can capture different types of uh, intuition. Let's let, let's say there is some intuition that we have which can be put down using some choice of alpha and beta. Uh, so now what what do we do with this prior? Well, of course we need to write down the posterior now, right? So we need to write down the um, well we need to write down p of theta given data, um, and we said that well this is proportional to p of data given theta into p of theta and uh, all this prior is telling us is the like is the is the pdf for p of theta. Uh, now, how, how does the p of theta given data look like if your data comes from a Bernoulli likelihood that is what we want to find out. In other words, we want to find out the pdf of p given data uh, at some value of p. Now, this is proportional to the uh, Bernoulli likelihood which we know looks like uh, product of i equals 1 to n p power x i um, into 1 minus p power 1 minus x i. We have already seen while we discussed maximum likelihood that this is our Bernoulli likelihood. 
right. So, this is our likelihood function uh, for seeing of course, the data x 1 to x n and p of theta uh, we are saying can be encoded as p power alpha minus 1 into 1 minus p power beta minus 1 right. So, this is our prior right. So, this is prior this is likelihood uh, and if I multiply this I should get of course, I have to divide by the evidence, but then I am that is why I am not saying equal to, but then proportional to um, what I would get as the uh, PDF of the posterior. Now, now the interesting thing that you might already be noticing is that so in the prior and likelihood both have the form p power something into 1 minus p power something right. So, they look similar um, at least uh, functionally. So, which means I can uh, you know somehow combine this and say that this is proportional to p power you know sum over x i this guy is p power sum over x i plus alpha minus 1 into 1 minus p power sum over 1 minus x i uh, plus beta minus 1 right. So, this is what my p d f of my posterior uh, looks is proportional to right. So, it is just a simplification of this thing. Uh, of course, I am saying proportional to because there is some normalizing constant which is needed to make this a real PDF. It has to integrate to 1 and so on, uh, but uh, we will see that that is not so important as we will see in a minute. Um, so, what does this tell us right? So, the very interesting thing that this tells us is that f of p was of the form p power something into 1 minus p power something. Our prior shape was of the form p power alpha minus 1, 1 minus p power alpha minus 1. Now, our posterior also this distribution also has the same functional form right. So, same and that is that is that does not happen for all choices of prior I will comment about that in a minute. So, this is some functional form same functional form as the prior right. So, the posterior also has the functional form p power something into 1 minus p power something which means that we know that the posterior distribution is also a beta distribution. Now, the parameters are no longer alpha and beta for the prior it was alpha and beta, but now the posterior's parameter are not alpha and beta. They depend on the prior's parameter alpha and beta, but then they also depend on the data right. So, it is a beta distribution, but then the parameters have now changed. It is as if you are only updating the parameter of the distribution and you do not have to exactly calculate the density at all values of p. You do not have to completely calculate the entire function right. So, entire density if you know the parameter then you know you get the function for free. So, so interestingly this is this does not happen by you know for all choices of uh, priors. So, if I did not choose a beta distribution if I had chosen some other complicated distribution between 0 and 1 that encoded my prior knowledge it is not necessary that if I multiply it with the Bernoulli likelihood, I will get a beta posterior that is not at all necessary right. So, you will still get a posterior it might be useful and all that, but it is need not be you know convenient in the sense that your prior and the posterior of the same functional form. In this particular case it happens right. So, we start with the beta prior um, which means we have some parameters alpha and beta and now uh, after seeing data the updated hunch is a beta posterior it is also beta um, and the data is Bernoulli right. So, Bernoulli. Now, what are the parameters of this posterior? Well, pause and think about it I will tell you now. So, this is just alpha plus sum over x i comma beta plus sum over 1 minus x i. Now, one way to think about sum over x i is just the number of heads n h number of heads in my data and sum over 1 minus x i is the number of tails right. <clears throat> so, what does this uh, kind of uh, tells us? It tells us that if I started with some value alpha and beta I observe n h tails and n t ta n h heads and n t tails in my data then my updated belief about the parameters looks like a beta distribution with parameters number of heads plus alpha and number of tails plus beta. Now, if you had used a simple maximum likelihood then it would be only number of heads and number of tails which would have determined our guess right. So, it would be n h by n h plus n t which is just n right. So, n h by n would be our guess which is what we saw as our guess for the maximum likelihood estimator. Now, here we are saying uh, one way to guess 
after getting this beta posterior could be uh, guessing as alpha plus nh divided by one possible guess uh, guess could be to look at alpha plus nh by alpha plus nh plus beta plus nt which is alpha plus nh divided by alpha plus beta plus n nh plus nt is just n right um, now this might be our guess if we had to commit to a single guess then we might commit to this case and in in fact this turns out uh, for this particular case to be the expected value of the posterior of the posterior right so is expected value of any beta distribution with parameters alpha and beta is alpha divided by alpha plus beta in this case the posterior is uh, a beta with alpha plus nh comma beta plus nt and the expected value of this turns out to be exactly this value now this is kind of telling us essentially that um, let's let's think about this for a second right so we have some data which have nh tails and nt nh heads and nt tails uh, if you had to do a maximum likelihood estimator we would have said the number of heads by n that is our estimator now we are saying number of heads plus alpha divided by n plus alpha plus beta it is as if we are saying that we have our data and we also have this extra ghost data which have alpha heads and beta tails if we had our data and an extra alpha plus beta data points where we had alpha heads and beta tails well then we would have guessed our maximum likelihood estimator as alpha plus nh divided by alpha plus beta plus n which is exactly what is the expected value of the posterior now what does this tell us this tells us that in this particular example the prior using the beta prior can be thought of as if thinking that we did some ghost experiments or pseudo experiments which are not real data but then these pseudo data ghost data which which have alpha plus beta data points out of which alpha showed up heads and beta showed up tails that is what is giving us our beliefs right so it is as if somebody came and said hey i did 100 experiments 80 of them happened to be heads 20 of them happened to be tails now if somebody told us that then we converted that into a hunch using a beta prior with alpha as 80 and beta as 20 now it is as if we have con once we do this the posterior will take take into account these ghost data samples also and then will give us a maximum likelihood estimator it could be thought of as that way right so that is that is one way to interpret uh, what's what's going on here so in general um, you know you could this might be one way to make a single guess uh, from the posterior which is using the expected value of the posterior there are other ways you can make guesses which is what is called as a map estimator uh, which is to say that well in maximum likelihood we wrote down the likelihood function and we picked the value which maximizes the likelihood in the map estimator which is a maximum uh, a posteriori estimator uh, estimator we look at the maximizer of the posterior distribution right so now you have a, a posterior distribution now you look at which value has the maximum pdf right so pdf value or the likelihood and then you make that as your guess right so that's typically called as p hat map um, and in this case it will be slightly different from alpha by alpha plus beta right so so the point is that now you have an updated hunch which gives you belief system over all possible values that your parameter could take not a, not committing to a single value if you want to commit to a single value you can either take the mode of this distribution which is the maximum a posteriori uh, estimator you can take the expected value you can take whatever you want right so you can take the uh, you can take some samples average them everything is possible because you have an entire distribution at your hand right so so this way of modeling things uh, is what is called as a bayesian way of modeling things so uh, to summarize at a very high level um, we have looked at two different types of estimation procedures one is called as uh, uh, the maximum likelihood procedure uh, which just writes down the likelihood function and then tries to maximize it to get a point estimate um, the bayesian world starts with a hunch about our parameter to estimate and then converts that hunch into an updated hunch via the data 
and using the Bayes theorem. And once you have an updated hunch, which is a distribution over all possible choices our parameters can take, then you can either convert that into a single estimator if you want by taking the posteriori ma maximum a posteriori estimate or you can take the expected value or you can do whatever you want. So, these are two broad ways of uh, doing estimations. Um, now, this is all you know basic statistical ideas. Um, what we are going to do next is use these ideas specifically the principle, principle of maximum likelihood. Um, and see how that can be used for a very, very specific uh, unsupervised learning problem, um, which will give us a probabilistic twist to a clustering algorithm that we have already seen, which is the k-means algorithm. Uh, so far, k-means, for instance, did not assume any probabilistic model for data. So now, if you assume a reasonable probabilistic model for data, uh, can you come up with a probabilistic version or a probabilistic counterpart to clustering algorithm or can we come up with a probabilistic counterpart to the representation learning algorithms right so these are the type of questions we are going to ask next and that will give us the real power of using all these techniques that we have learned here in, including maximum likelihood or even bayesian methods um, when we want to apply it to specific unsupervised learning machine learning problems like representation learning or clustering and the next thing that we will see is uh, how to use this for you know estimation ideas for uh, coming up with a probabilistic version of the clustering algorithm. Uh, we will see that next time. Um, hope uh, you enjoyed this uh, video. Thank you.